Hello and welcome to another episode of Open Banking Expo TV in association with Mambu. I'm Ellie Duncan, Head of Content here at Open Banking Expo. And today I'm joined by Scott Wilson, VP of Commercial at Mambu, and Alina Baluta, Growth Officer at Salt Edge. In this episode titled Open Banking and the Emerging Trends Shaping 2022, Scott and Alina will be explaining what Mambu's 2022 Partners Predictions Report reveals about what to expect from open banking and open payments this year and the impact of these emerging trends on banks and fintechs. As financial institutions continue their digital transformation programmes, what will this mean for the customer experience? What are the implications for banks that fail to keep up with their transformation targets? Our guests will also consider what 2022 has in store for innovation in the payment space and what future partnerships between banks and fintechs will look like. Now, before we get the discussion underway, I'm pleased to say that entries for the Open Banking Expo Awards are now open. So you have until the 1st of April to get your entries into us. Go to the website, openbankingexpo.com for more details and best of luck. Now, without further ado, let's come to the Mambu report and my kind of first question around customer experience uh, for you, Scott, and, and perhaps you can also set us up with a bit of an introduction to the report. But I know that in this report, um, it, it sort of reveals that customer experiences will continue to kind of drive success in the digital banking space. So my question to you is really, what can banks and financial institutions do to live up to customer expectations for digital experiences within financial services? Thank you, Ellie, and uh, it's great to be here. So um, yeah, two, two things to cover maybe quickly in this part. First, I'll just introduce Mambu uh, and also talk about the predictions report for the year ahead. So Mambu is a, is a financial services platform uh, with, which operates with the purpose of building great financial experiences for people all over the world. We're a multi-tenant SaaS platform uh, that is cloud native with an API first approach, and we're headquartered uh, out of Europe with about 200 customers. So now to the report, which we've uh, worked closely with the industry on, uh, and it worked uh, to, to focus on the emerging trends and industry uh, perspectives that are gonna shape 2022. Coinciding with that is the digital innovation that's accelerated during the pandemic and the customer expectations that have grown used to this and how do we then continue to deliver that experience and loyalty. And the industry experts shared their hottest trends for 2022 and there were eight trends that were identified from embedded finance all the way through to sustainable ethical impact finance. And I know that we're gonna talk on most of those uh, throughout the session uh, today, but you also talk to customer experience and to answer that part of the question, you know, it's really centered on a bank's ability to provide services to customers anywhere and anytime. Uh, and therefore a bank or a financial institution needs to ask themselves, you know, how can they deliver on this requirement and what tools are needed to do that successfully? And customers typically want flexibility uh, they also want resilience in the short term, but the ability to build financial wealth for the long term. And this digital consumption is seen across all demographics and not just millennials. And the same applies for businesses too. So as a result, you know, banks need to just reconsider their banking platform, how that will allow them to be agile and innovative. And one of the key trends that we've identified to help support this is that notion of embedded finance um, and the ability to have services anywhere you know, and any time. So we'll talk more about that, uh, I'm sure, in the in the coming session. Yeah, absolutely. And um, look, I want to, to bring Alina in at this point as we move on to kind of talk about platformization of banking. So we know banks are under pressure from fintechs and other challenger banks. Um, because many of those are already running kind of cloud native platforms. So some of the outdated technology that banks are burdened with is, you know, obviously accounts for, for lack of agility, for um, a lack of scalability and innovation as well. Um, so I want to find out, Alina, what steps are companies taking to further amplify their user experiences? Uh, perhaps you can, you can highlight maybe some areas of best practice here as well. Yeah, uh, it's great to be here, same. 
uh, well, banks, like any business, have to adapt to consumer needs to exist, basically. So agility, scalability, and innovation is indeed crucial for uh, a business in such a competitive landscape where uh, giants like Google make it into financial services. And competing with them is not easy. There are like several elements that, can, uh, um, that uh, should focus on. Uh, when the, trying to transform uh, a digital platform, that would be omnichannel banking, where all users' interactions are instrumented from one central platform without being dispersed via multiple channels. Or we can consider modular banking that involves creating a modular uh, architecture that interacts and responds to uh, consumer expectations based on more agile processes. Open banking. Uh, making the best out of APIs in order to accelerate banking digitalization and implementation of uh, new services and smart banking, uh, using the data that we have from the consumer for accurate segmentation and understanding the customer needs. Yet, uh, the main thing I should, uh, we should focus here would be the business strategy and the picture of success as the bank sees it. Uh, the reason why we are doing what we're doing, and this should be the main element that drives any need of transformation. Either you go for a more flexible technology to make it for easy, easier to you, for, for you to adapt in the future, or will you partner with a vendor that has like multiple integrations with fintechs, or would you build a platform or a um, technology that will allow you to build services and products in-house? I think Scott has more insights on this. Yeah, sure. I can I can add a, a follow up to that as well. And I think the interesting piece you talked about there, Alina, is uh, is the likes of Google and their transformation process. You know, if you if you look at the history of of the evolution in the banking sector, you know, the days of large scale one time transformations are, are quickly disappearing, uh, and they're typically over expensive. They run over budget. They carry a higher risk profile. You know, and do not finish on time. You know, when we look at big tech, they've created really kind of fast, iterative innovation cycles, uh, which are facilitated by open APIs and third party fintechs, which help facilitate and further enhance their opportunity in the marketplace. You know, and therefore, forward looking banks and forward thinking banks may choose between two paths. The first path might be transforming themselves into a modern mm -hmm. fintech or potentially being the infrastructure provider that supports other fintechs. Um, but regardless of the model chosen, um, either one requires flexibility uh, to deliver on that customer experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, flexibility is obviously um, a really important word there, I think. And um, look, when we're talking about open banking, um, as we've already alluded to, a lot of it is about kind of the end user, you know, improving the experience for them. And, and I think um, obviously through the pandemic, we've seen an increase uh, adoption of open banking. Um, but there is still some kind of misunderstanding, perhaps, on the, uh, the consumer side about what open banking really is, how it works. So there is this kind of um, emphasis on or onus, if you like, on banks to, to maybe educate consumers around open banking um, and what really it can do for them. Uh, but Alina, what developments will we see in open banking this year and, and how can providers better inform their, their customers about the benefits? Well, let's start from the basic that despite the initial uh, reluctance towards the open APIs, banks are starting uh, to understand their potential and almost 70% of them in Europe implemented API gateways to accelerate their digital products. On the other hand, we had the pandemic that had a uh, um, significant uh, impact on increasing and adoption of open banking use. In UK alone, open banking users increased from 1 million in 2022, 2020, sorry, to, 20, uh, to 4 million in 2021. And uh, the developments around uh, open banking, they are addressing like direct customer pain. We finally become more aware of our money. We want to be in control of it, to see it everywhere. Uh, to see it in the way that we are used to in one place and not feel like it's actually banking. We want uh, uh, smart options to save our money and move our money around. And this is where uh, the open banking comes and address those pains. Open banking from one side gives the overview and the control over their money, like account information contributes to view everything in one place. 
and combined with smart banking that gives um, the insights on better financial behavior, you see those developments in use cases like uh, personal finance management, and, uh, lending decisioning and treasury management and liquidity management. While the main drivers of open banking adoptions are really the payments and the need to have options on how to move money seamlessly at a lower cost. And we will see the rise of open banking payments as soon as the bank will understand how to monetize it. And they will improve their payment APIs and they will adopt uh, frameworks like variable recurrent payments. Uh, and there will be demand also from merchants for such options of payments that they didn't have before. Consumers should be informed by the channels that they use every day. Uh, so main interaction goes to their bank apps, the fintech apps, uh, the banks need to build transparency on how open banking is secure and how are we in control of the data. While the main, uh, the main demand or the main, uh, let's say, channel of communication would be the fintechs and the merchants because they are the one driving demand in open banking and they should build awareness on open benefits. Yeah, Scott, do you, do you want to add to, to what Alina's just said there and, and, and give your view on kind of um, open banking and, and, and smart banking, which I know is something you mentioned earlier? Yeah, no, thank you. And Alina talks to a lot of good points about the progress the industry has made in, in open banking and the use cases that are available. Um, but maybe to speak specifically on how to inform that customer base through the lens of open banking versus smart banking, uh, I'll reflect on a survey Mambu did last year. It was called Disruption Diaries. We asked about 2000 customers what they thought about this very topic. And we found that 80% used one or more FinTech apps, which would kind of correlate with Alina's suggestions that the industry is progressing in this direction. Yet 52% of those same customers or consumers had never heard of open banking. So it's an interesting correlation that they think they're participating or are participating in this space, but they didn't know it. Um, mm. And um, coupled with that were a lot of concerns around data sharing and privacy. So if I put those pieces together and think about open banking, you know, my thought process on informing the customer base or consumer base is about transitioning away from a business to business lens, where we often use complex, uh, ambiguous terminology to talk about open banking. Uh, industry speak. Um, instead, your, your typical consumer doesn't need to know some of these complexities. And if the businesses and industries and fintechs move towards more human to human interactions, we'll see that engagement level increase. And we need to really focus on the value, choice and flexibility. And I think the key deterrent that we see in the market today is around the risk or in, and use of someone's data. So we need to make it clear that it will be protected um, but they will instantly receive value in this data exchange. Although big tech has some of its challenges, it has convinced billions of people around the world to globally to participate in the data exchange economy. And these are the same individuals who should be actively participating within open banking. So I think you know, the dialogue needs to change a little bit uh, in terms of the uh, engagement around open banking. Yeah, and interesting that stat you brought in there about, you know, the number of consumers actually using kind of open banking apps and services and then kind of not even realising what it is. And uh, even, you know, the phrase open banking, I think, can perhaps uh, give consumers the wrong idea about kind of security content. Indeed. So um, let's move on to kind of another aspect of the Mambu report. Um, and talk about cashless payments. Um, you know, we've obviously seen quite a big shift in recent years, again, spurred on by the pandemic to a kind of cashless society. Um, traditional payment systems perhaps can't deliver the kind of efficiency and agility that uh, banks need now. So, um, Alina, when we consider innovation in the payments space and in new payment features, what do you anticipate for this year? Well, global payments are indeed undergoing a transformation like never before. We really believe that in the next like five to 10 years, consumers, businesses and all kinds of institutions will be able to send, uh, receive domestic and cross-border payments instantly and with full transparency into cost. And they will be able to monitor and manage liquidity position in real time 
across providers, geographies, currencies, and they will be seamlessly integrated, each of these capabilities into some core business activities. Uh, the destination is clear, but the, uh, the role there is uh, different from industry to industry. And the main thing that is expected now in this year uh, is the coexistence and the interaction of traditional rail, let's say, like swift innovations, uh, and the one with the more emerging technologies in the landscape of payments, like open banking, digital currency, with each channel remaining relevant for, for its specific benefits. Uh, achieving this interoperability among rails, new and old, this will be crucial for this year, and bank will, banks will need to provide um, a platform and a holistic uh, suite of solution across these multiple channels that I've mentioned in order to cover all the needs that the consumer will bring up to them. Uh, this means continually investing and in leading the advancements in payments, like being aware of what's happening on the market and enhancing both those traditional rails and the new uh, industry initiatives like open banking, like Swift GAP, um, real-time capabilities, digital currency, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, and maybe all those hype words that you see mentioned, but they are really uh, bringing benefits and they have the specific cons consumer uh, needs behind them. So through continuum of services, bringing all those elements together, banks can fully support their clients to improve, especially the digital journeys, because the main thing that people want from banking is to banking to not feel like banking. Like we want everything simple in our life. And this refers also to banking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Scott, I want to come to you now and talk about um, embedded finance. That's something that a kind of a term we've, we've heard quite a bit is indeed you mentioned it earlier on in our discussion, the idea being that it kind of blurs the boundaries between um, goods and the financial supply chain. So uh, ultimately it should benefit the end consumer, of course, but what makes embedded finance so indispensable for banks and financial institutions? Yeah, no, uh, very topical. And you know, in the last 15 or so minutes, we've talked a lot about the need for flexibility, a modern banking platform, the fact that financial services are actually being offered outside of banks. So I'm going to take a slightly different view on this one, which is the outside in view and look at the investment being made in this space alone, because that really talks to the fact that this can't be ignored. And in 2020, you know, as a reference, the investment in this space uh, or a fintech investment was about 40 billion. And in the first half of 2021 alone, this was around 52 billion. So huge growth just in the space of a year. Um, and there is therefore a need to react. Uh, and if banks and FIs want to be a part of this growth journey, that needs to be kind of taken into consideration today. And this investment is ultimately decentralizing the provision of financial services outside of banks, which is completely in the center of embedded finance. You know, and some may say, well, it's a relatively small amount of capital compared to the global bank's market cap of eight trillion. But the bigger question is, you know, how quickly will these fintechs grow and what will this do to customer loyalty and therefore market share and who's going to play in the space? Uh, and on top of this, you know, 65 percent of consumers trust the likes of Apple, Google and Amazon to handle their financial needs. That typically probably wouldn't have been the case 10 years ago. And it was the incumbent banking sector that used to rely heavily in this trust. But we're seeing other players in this embedded finance arena start to now take some of that trust on top of the innovation and top of the flexibility and the modern technology to capture that market share. And, you know, I've talked about the growth in investment in 2020 and 2021. You know, the market expects that embedded finance will see about 138 billion um, in market valuation by the end of 2026. So a lot of growth uh, has taken place. There's still a lot more growth. Uh, you know, the question is, you know, do you think this is a market that you want to play in and how important is it for you to capture that loyalty uh, and market share? Yeah, and, and if, if those um, organizations, the kind of tech giants decide they do want to, to play, you know, what kind of opportunities do they kind of need to capitalize on then to, yeah. to be in this embedded finance space? I, th I think there's four components to this. Um, you know, the first is we know customers want a flexible and current customer offering. 
Um, and that need needs to be met anywhere, anytime. We all know that, and we've heard that on probably multiple podcasts. You know, the piece is, how do you deliver on that? And that is a modern technology stack you know, that's typically cloud native, um, that is open to third party APIs, but also there's a willingness to invest in creating that ecosystem partnership. You know, all individual banks or financial institutions have a finite R&D spend on their own innovation. So how do they leverage uh, that ecosystem around and build up partnerships to better create stickiness for that customer loyalty? So they're the, the four or so things that I think are pretty important that need to be uh, considered to capitalize on the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and let's um, talk about this kind of investment in big tech um and come back to that because we've obviously we've alluded to this dated infrastructure that the banks have and these digital transformation kind of journeys that are underway but we haven't really talked about what the implications are if banks actually don't deliver on their transformation strategies um so what will happen to those institutions that, that don't meet certain kind of digital expectations will they lose customers to fintechs uh, or what do you think scott yeah, so I think there's a couple of pieces there. We talked a bit about the transformation expectation and the iterative innovation cycles. And Alina mentioned Google, you know, I've mentioned Amazon and Apple. You know, these are the big tech firms that are just playing in multiple industries um, without us maybe consciously knowing it. Um, and you know, it, in order to meet the transformation needs, you know, the banking sector, financial institutions need to start thinking in, in a big tech mindset. And if you don't meet those customer expectations, you'll see that reduction in loyalty, reduction in revenues and market share. And especially now in the day and age where fintechs have made it so easy for consumers to sign up or big tech has made it so easy for consumers to sign up, enjoy its services. You know, there's a massive reduction in barriers to entry and consumers can move easily between providers. Um, and the luxury of a sticky customer base is, is somewhat being removed. But if we think about big tech and what embracing big tech means, it really talks to the, to, the, to, the, to the skill that they have in aggregating and analyzing big data on customers that allows them to better position useful products to a customer segment. And this is called hyper-personalization. And as I talked about, they've convinced consumers to part with their information in return for instant gratification. You know, and to achieve this, it requires you know, two pretty significant shifts. The first is what is your legacy core banking system and is it modern enough to uh, function in a, in a way that can provide that capability? But the second is about a change in mindset and it's the mindset of the leaders in industry to have the cultural agility in, in planning and decision-making that we often see in the big tech space um, and the need to act like a technology business but you offer a financial services product. Today, there's still somewhat uh, a mindset in the incumbent space that they're a financial services company that uses a platform. We need to sometimes kind of reverse that logic to be agile. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, cultural uh, shift, isn't it? And um, we are already seeing that play out. Um, and I guess we've also seen, you know, uh, banks and fintechs partner um, so move away from being kind of in competition or in direct competition with each other and, and actually partner up and embrace those cultural differences. So Alina, what do banks and fintechs respectively bring to the wider ecosystems and, and how are they able to kind of collaborate to enhance customer experiences? Well, I will mention here the, the mindset that Scott mentioned uh, on the above. If we examine the drivers, the challenges and the opportunities in the financial service industry, it's increasingly evident that we should stay at the same table, even if we are kind of historically locked in competitions, banks and fintechs. Overall, like 65% of banks, credit unions, they already entered into at least one fintech partnership in the past three years, let's say, and more than 30% invested themselves in a fintech startup. Like the drivers to cooperate for the fintechs, it's obvious, like the banks have an established client base, they have the trust of their consumers, they have investment budgets, and they have some internal know-how that is validated through time. For the banks, the drivers to collaborate with fintechs 
is to enable the best uh, digital uh, uh, consumer experience that there is in the market, the best technology there is in the market, and to benefit from those technological investments. On the other hand, we have the dependability of established banking infrastructure, the credibility with the regulator and the customer, uh, wide, wide customer base that the banks have. And on the other side, there's the freedom to innovate, the agility of building whatever business model there is to capture some new uh, streams of revenue. So let's imagine a bank with a wide customer base. Attracting a whole new set of customers is not an easy feat. So what about the consumers that don't want to leave the trusted financial institutions? By designing solution for established uh, banks to leverage, not only the fintechs are tapping into the millions of existing consumers that the banks have, but they free themselves of the focus uh, and can do the things that they do best, like the technology, the product, uh, the best possible customer experience, rather than uh, acquiring the, that customer uh, base. I believe that the best way forward is for established financial institutions to partner with pure play fintechs that are not competing with the banks. Uh, I think success is predicated on presenting the united front or with each partner doing what they do best. Like everybody should focus on, on what drives their business. Uh, we work in the most heavily regulated, uh, arguably the most dependent on industry there is. So I think the future really depends on our collaboration. Absolutely. And, and finally, then let's talk about sustainable ethical impact finance, which is something, Scott, you mentioned at the very top of this episode, um, which is because you looked at it in the report. Um, you know, we've had a, a lot uh, about sustainable uh, finance. That kind of term has been bandied around a lot, obviously, over the past couple of years. So, Alina, starting with you, what what role does ESG play, um, considering it is an area of really rapidly growing interest, um, but also beyond the the financial industry? But there have already been some important hints on where this uh, the world moves in terms of financial sustainability. And those uh, examples are mostly seen in fintech business models. Uh, some have it as a main product, some have it as a line of product, or they're adding like sustainability feature to, to their products. And some of those examples you would see in donation features, you would see in uh, carbon footprint calculators, you will see in digital investment solution like sustainable investment services and climate friendly pension funds, uh, green lending solution. Uh, even uh, through embedded finance, you will see that in fintechs that analyze energy consumption and they identify some energy switching options. Um, open banking and payments API, they have enabled uh, a category growth for this kind of uh, fintech uh, business models. And adding to the consumer behavior needs, there will be regulation. And this will be another driver that will push financial institution to uh, adapt or adopt sustainability in the way they're doing business. Uh, alone in the EU and UK, we will see a number of uh, ESG regulated um, um, frameworks come in force in this year or next year, the latest. Mm -hmm. Scott, do you want to, to add to that in terms of what, what you expect to see this year and, and uh, around kind of aligning values with customer values? Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I mean, just to, to add a quick point here, for me, this is obviously a massive trend that we've seen here in, in our predictions report, and it's, it's noted in society uh, anyway. But it, it, for me, the focus is around talent as well as consumers. So today, given the current employment market to attract and to retain great talent, you need to have initiatives that are very clear and open in industry. And millennials are, are even more conscious than they probably used to be about this. But the same is also for the conscious consumer. Uh, and Alina was talking to that point. Uh, and public and social expectations are, are only rising around this space. So for me, it's about the talent that you want to attract to, to actually be a part of your financial institution or your fintech. But also just on the on the numbers side, it's it's the ability to capture what some estimate to be a three trillion uh, dollar market by 2030. And they they anticipate that the premium on sustainable products that Alina is talking about will be about 15 to 30 percent higher 
than what historically that product may have captured in the market. So there's a bit of a talent piece, but also the, the premium a fintech or an FI might be able to gain from this uh, in terms of value and growth. Mm -hmm. Well, look, it's, it's clear there's a lot to look forward to this year. So um, Scott and Alina, thank you both for your insights today. Um, and also thank you, Mambu, as well, for uh, working with us on this TV episode. Um, thank you also for watching, of course. There are other episodes of Open Banking Expo TV on the website. Just go to the on-demand section of openbankingexpo.com. That's all we have time for today, but do join us again soon. Thank you and goodbye. Mm -hmm.